Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. My name is Jeff Madison. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope Summit, and I uh, want to thank you all for being here today and put out a welcome to all those who are joining us online right now live. Uh, make sure that you say hello. Uh, go ahead and type in that you're there and let us know that you're there. Uh, or maybe you're catching up with us later throughout the week. We got a lot of people who are uh, attending services with us at like Thursday. Uh, it's great. And, uh, and from actually all over the United States. And sometimes there was uh, someone from New Zealand watching us once, which was pretty cool. So, uh, so welcome to all. We're so glad that you're here. Today's a fun day. Uh, we are having our baby dedications. And so we have uh, families. I'm actually going to invite the families to come on up. We're going to do this right here at the beginning. So come on up. And uh, what, what we do at Hope Summit consistently throughout the years uh, is uh, twice a year, we will have a be- baby dedication. Now at Hope Summit, uh, we, we don't baptize infants. Uh, we believe that baptism is a choice made by the individual. And uh, so we don't baptize, but we do take seriously the dedication that it's important for uh, parents to come before their church family and dedicate their children and make a declaration that, that uh, we want to raise these children to follow Jesus, but also to make an appeal to the church uh, to be a part of this. Uh, you've probably heard the saying uh, that it takes a village to raise a child, right? And uh, so I'm going to actually pass this microphone and uh, let you guys introduce yourselves and your little kiddos here, and uh, then we will do our dedication. Good morning. Um, I'm Jordan Jacobson. This is my husband, Nate, and our daughter, Elise. Is that good? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. (laughs) I am Kara Jazeski. This is my husband, Steve, and our son, Easton. My name's David Schultz, and this is my wife, Savetta, and our daughter, Brianna. That's right. And uh, they have, uh, if you'll notice the pictures, in fact, Matt, you can just keep kind of scrolling through those pictures. They have uh, picked out a a verse for their child, kind of a life verse for their child. Uh, but uh, the reason that, again, that we do this, Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train the child in the way that they should go, and they will not easily turn away from it. And that's why uh, dedicating our children is really important. And uh, so parents, I actually have, um, I have a declaration uh, that uh, we want to uh, uh, kind of hold you to in a good way, uh, uh, accountability is is really important when we want to set out in the right direction, and so may today be kind of the stake in the in in the journey of your child. Yes, this is exciting, isn't it? This is so exciting. Yeah, that this would be kind of a stake in the road that you can forever look back on and say, no, that day we made a declaration that we are going to raise them to follow Jesus. So, parents, I ask you if you commit to raise your children to be in a Christian home as a part of your church family with the foundation of the Bible in hope that one day that they themselves would make the choice to follow Jesus. If so, if that's what you want, uh, repeat after me, with God's help we will. With God's help. All right, now church, I would like you to stand. I would like you to stand. Now, I love I love uh, baby dedication days because we get to meet a lot of family because this is a big deal for you guys as well. Uh, you guys are going to have a huge opportunity to be a part of influencing this 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 child that uh, that you've come to see that you've come to celebrate, and I hope that uh, you take seriously that that God has a plan for you to help raise them, to help show them, and that there will be times. I did youth ministry for many many years. There will be times times especially in those teenage years when they don't want to talk to their parents. Okay, they they they're gonna. Th- we all kind of went through it. Maybe not all of us, but I know I went through that phase where I thought my parents were just complete idiots, right? You are going to be the ones that they come to in a big way. That you are going to be the ones that offer support in those times, okay? So, so I'm going to ask you and our church body, church, will you commit with me to surround these families with the love of Christ and support them as they commit to raise their children to follow Jesus? If so, Repeat after me, with God's help, we will. will. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for these children, and we thank you for life. We thank you for the renewal of life that we receive. Lord God, we thank you that uh, these families have made this dedication that they want to raise their children to follow you. 
We know that this world can be a scary place, can be a difficult place. But Lord God, with your love, Lord God, with, with your grace, Lord God, with your direction, these children will not just survive this world, but they will thrive. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would watch over them. Lord God, that you would beat down a path before them, that you would prepare for them great influences that are going to encourage them to follow the right way. Lord God, we ask that they would find friends that will encourage them to go the right direction. Lord God, that you would provide teachers and coaches and other people who are going to influence them, and that, that you will prepare in advance the way that they're going to help them grow and become the men and women that you have made them to be. But Lord God, above all, I pray that they would know that you love them. Lord God, that they would forever know that they would never doubt that you are there, that you are with them, and that you are always by their side. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we thank you. We thank you, and we ask that uh, you would bless them as they, as they go. And watch over their parents, Father. Give them wisdom. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I was actually praying really long just to watch how long you could juggle him. That was, that was a lot of fun. All right. You guys may be seated. We have gifts for you. As you guys, uh, as you guys go, you can go get your gifts. Yeah, you are done. Thank you. I always want to like say let's let's clap for them, but like you know like good job you had kids. But <laughs> yeah, we have another really cool thing that we are going to be doing coming up here. It is um, uh, something that we do every single year at Hope Summit. Uh, there is an organization in town called Damascus Way. It's a it's a halfway house located here in Rochester where men come out of prison and they kind of restart their lives. And uh, every year around Christmas time, what we do is we'll put a tree up in the back and on that tree will be these tags that have gifts that we can purchase for them. Uh, and then what we do is we take all the gifts that you guys buy for them and we have a meal. We have a, we have a meal, a home-cooked meal, something really awesome. And either they come here or we take it to them and I'm telling you guys, it is one of my favorite times of the year. Um, even, even in the midst of COVID, they let me come and be a part of this meal. Uh, because these guys, uh, so often the stuff they're asking for are like work boots, right? They're looking for coats. I'll never forget the day that, uh, that I was driving down the road and it was like negative 20 degrees outside. And I saw a guy riding a bike. And it was a guy who had come out of their program of Damascus Way. He was on his way to work at 20 below on his bicycle, but he was wearing the coat that one of you bought for him. And I'm telling you, you didn't cheap out on him either. I, I looked it up later. You spent like $300 on this guy, and you kept him warm. I love this because I get to see the generosity of our church, but it gets to fit a practical need for men who are basically restarting their lives. So very soon, I just want to get this in front of you very soon, we are going to be having that available, an opportunity for you to be a blessing again this year. So come these next couple of weeks excited to be able to pick something off of that tree knowing it's going to be a real blessing, okay? So why don't we stand and uh, I'm going to pray for our worship time. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. And now, Lord God, as we move into this time of worship, above all things, above all else, we want your name to be glorified. We want uh, the, the words that we sing to be honoring to you. And so, Lord, would, would you be pleased and would you be blessed by the words that we're about to sing? We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for the cross. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing this out, church. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I am to be, I see the song, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power.
cross, led on that cross, by burning gladly bearing, he bled and died, yes he did, to take away my sin. I sing it out church. Let's save my soul, my Savior God. If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, church? We're going to lift this up. Here we go. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, 
that one could stand and guess And if our God is for us, then you could ever stop us And if our God is with us, then what could stand and guess sing his praises. I believe it's scriptural when um, God loves to sing in church. Um, he loves to hear um, his people shout his name, proclaim his goodness. Hey, go ahead and take a seat, church. Um, right now, we want to kind of dive into our communion time. And if you guys didn't grab one of those communion cups um, and you want one, just raise your hand. One of our um, wonderful, wonderful Connections team people will give it to you. We'll come bring it to you if you want one. Um, I, I was reading this psalm uh, last week, and, this, um, and here's, here's, here's what it says. It's from Psalm 33, or 31. Excuse me. It says, For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net that they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I've probably read that before. Um, I love reading from the Psalms. They're always great to just open up, just read a chapter or two. I love reading about God's faithfulness and how he's redeemed man throughout all the time, through the beginning um, into now and, and, and how he's going to come back. Um, that last line when I read it, Psalm 31, uh, it says, into your hands I commit my spirit. Do you remember where that one, remember where that's from? Jesus said that on the cross when his mind, body, and spirit finally gave up. And that kind of hit me in the way that um, I didn't before, because I've read that many times. God's faithfulness um, to, to redeem his people, prophecies of old, Jesus finally coming onto the earth, living and walking, I was crucified for our sin which God had promised. And Jesus had allowed his body to be fully submitted uh, to that, um, to the will of the Father and to be faithful to the Father. And he was quoting that verse. Um, Jesus wanted to die for us, but it was going to hurt and he was going to receive the world's sin. And God was going to have to turn his back because he's a holy God. But in that moment, when Jesus died, he was submitting to the Father's will because God is faithful. And I just got to thinking, how many times have I been like, oh, Lord, yes, I'll do this. I'll do this. I remember the story. I was thinking I was eight. I told my mom, hey, Mom, I really want to take piano lessons. Yeah, I'll practice. Yeah, there's a couple of you that chuckled. <laughs> what eight-year-old wants to practice? What eight-year-old? Yeah, I want a puppy. Please, I want to get a puppy. I have, an eight, I have a five-year-old niece, Katie. Daddy, 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 can I get a goat? Yeah, yeah, I'll feed it, I'll feed it, I'll feed it. 
Guess who's feeding the goat? Daddy. You know what I mean? When we say things that we're like, oh, we'll be faithful to it. We'll promise. And we fall short. We fall short all the time. But God never falls short, y'all. Yeah. And when it says God's faithful, that that might be a, a strange word to some of you. What that means is God never fades. God never fail, falls away. He's sovereign over all things. He's faithful. He is there from the beginning. He's there now. He will be there tomorrow. I promise you. Church, when we celebrate communion, when I say that, we celebrate communion. We come together as a church and a body because it's good. It's good for us to do this together, for us to remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. It's a good thing for us to get in the habit of doing this because sometimes even for me, and I think I could speak for uh, the, uh, us up here, sometimes our weeks are so busy that this is the only time. And that's not the way it's supposed to be, but I'm glad that I can at least fall on the fact that I every Sunday I get to come in with believers to uh, remember the cross, remember that we put Jesus up there and we couldn't save ourselves. Nothing on earth. We, can't, we can do as much as we want. We can work as long as we want. We can get as much money as we want. That's not going to save you. Jesus saved you. Church, when we come together, let us take this deep breath of remembrance and, and, and Jesus. Is, we're going to sing a song, and I want you to take communion during that song. You can sing with us. You can just sit there. If you're not comfortable taking communion, you don't have to. Please, don't feel, don't feel um, like you have to. But um, let me pray for this moment for us and uh, for God to come in and, 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 and his spirit to come in our hearts. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, when we, um, when we say, when we shout these praises that, um, that you are our God, you are stronger than any other, we mean that. Because you're faithful. You're the only thing that's stronger than all gods, all things, and everything. God, we pray for this time of communion. Pray that you bless this moment. You bless this interaction that we have with you. Each one of us are having is something different. I just pray in this moment as you um, reveal yourself to us that we receive that. We ponder on it. We um, we reciprocate it, but God, we also continue to reach out for it, continue to desire that interaction with you, that one-on-one -on -one interaction with you. God, we pray this in your name. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in bountiful witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love.
sin and a peace that endureth thine own deep presence to cheer it to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside together. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, unto me. Amen. Hi, what's your name, darling? My name is Susan Boyle. Okay, uh, Susan, um, where are you from? I am from Blackburn, near Bathgate, West Lothian. It's a big town. It's a sort of collection of... It's a collection of... Uh, villages. I just think there. And how old are you, Susan? I am 47. And that's just one side of me. <laughs> okay, what's the dream? I, I'm trying to be a professional singer. And why hasn't it worked out so far, Susan? I've never been given the chance before, but here's hoping it'll change. Okay, and who would you like to be as successful as? Elaine Page. Elaine Page. Like what are you going to sing tonight? I'm going to sing I Dreamed a Dream from the Miserables. Okay. Big song. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. I dreamed a dream in time gone by.
without a doubt, that was the biggest surprise I have had in three years on this show. When you stood there with that cheeky grin and said, I, I want to be like a lame page, everyone was laughing at you. No one is laughing now. That was stunning. An incredible performance. Amazing. I'm reeling from shock about you two, but... I am so thrilled because I know that everybody was against you. I honestly think that we were all being very cynical and... I think that's the biggest wake-up call ever. And I just want to say that it was a complete privilege listening to that. It was in that is uh, one of my uh, favorite examples of the topic that we are going to be discussing today. Uh, that is an ugly part of humanity. It is something that affects all of us. It is something that, um, in a lot of ways, it's kind of a knee-jerk response. And uh, there's been studies on this. There's actually been studies on student Bo Susan Boyle there. Now, if you are watching online and for some reason uh, we got blocked by YouTube, uh, just so you know, just go look at uh, Susan Boyle from Britain's Got Talent. Go watch that video. You'll know what I'm talking about. But we are going to be talking today about that knee-jerk response, that quick bit of judgment, the way that we quickly make uh, judgments based on appearances. But we're going to talk about how the message that Jesus came to preach, the, the, the love that he came to share fights against that ugly side of our human nature. And the truth is, is that he wants to replace it with something so much better. So we're going to begin in prayer. And I ask that as we pray, that we would all humbly approach God's throne of grace, okay? Did you, hear, did you hear those words I just said? That we would humbly approach God's throne of grace as we approach this difficult topic. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for uh, this word that you have given us. Lord God, we thank you for, Jesus, your example, that you didn't just say these words, Jesus, you lived it. You showed us what it would look like for someone to live on this earth uh, who had the right to judge but chose not to. Uh, we thank you for that example. We just ask, Lord, that our hearts would change. We, we want to change. We want to see something different. And so, Lord, I pray that your word would do that in a mighty way, that your spirit would do that, that, it would, that your spirit would run free in this place, and that uh, you would you'd take, just take, take control, God, take our hearts. Uh, we love you because we just know that as we seek you, as we follow you, uh, we're going to be a part of making this world a place filled with love and grace and mercy and freedom. We thank you for that, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Um, so if you have your Bibles, you can open up to James. Now, um, before we dig into that, though, uh, I want to subvert some of, um, expectations today, okay? Um, so whether you've come to Hope Summit before or whether this is your first time visiting or maybe you've been a couple of times, um, normally uh, when I preach, um, it's, it's very different from what you're going to see today. Um, and the reason being um, is because today I don't want you to see me as a preacher. Today I want, to, I want, to, I want you to see me as kind of a tour guide, okay? And uh, we're going to be taking you on a tour of the many scriptures that God has put down. And I'm telling you guys, uh, the hardest part about preparing for today was taking out so much stuff that's in God's word because it is full of his teaching on what to do when it comes to judging other people. And so you are just getting the, uh, we're just gonna scratch the surface. And so it's not gonna, guys, it's not gonna feel like normal. And if you're new here, this isn't kind of normally how we do things. But just so you know, the, the, I, feel this, I felt this real, uh, for lack of a better word, burden to present uh, as many of these scriptures as I could. So I'm gonna shut up and we're gonna start. Sound good? All right, so James. Uh, we're going to be starting in James chapter 2. Now, if you don't have your Bibles, that's fine. It'll be on the screen behind me, or it'll be in front of me if you're watching online. And uh, if, if, if uh, you can't keep up, just write these down. Again, I want to encourage you to go read these. Uh, but we are, with the, uh, this, this verse in James, starting in James chapter 2, is kind of what's uh, bringing us to this topic, because we've been going through the New Testament chronologically, story by story by story, for like five years now. 
And so uh, we went through the whole Gospels, and then we went through a good portion of Acts. But around Acts 14, that's when the book of James is written. And, and it's, it's really good that we're studying it like this because context is important. And, and the context of which James was written, it was written from a leader of the church in Jerusalem who felt a burden for the church as a whole. So James is not written to like a church over here or a church over there or for the church in Jerusalem. It's written to any who claim to follow Jesus. And the reason he's writing this is because the church is starting to face some very difficult times. James chapter 1 talks about how, hey, let's talk about the trials we're facing. Now let's talk about what God wants to do in it. Uh, the very first disciple who would follow Jesus has already been killed. Okay, Peter, uh, one of the more famous apostles, he had been arrested by King Herod, and he was gonna, and he was facing a death sentence. But an angel freed him, and we we looked at that story. Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote like half of the New Testament, last we were with him in in our story, he had just been stoned to death almost. Uh, whether he was whether he died and God brought him back to life, or they they brought him to the point of death where he thought he was dead. We don't really know, but all we know is that things are getting dangerous. Not just uncomfortable, not just not just like hard, but dangerous to claim the name of Jesus. So James is writing this book, writing this letter that we now call a book. He's writing it to the church to tell them. It's very important information. This is how we live when things are difficult. Okay, that's the point. This is how we live when things are difficult. Now, James could be considered wisdom literature the way that he wrote it, okay? Like, a lot like Proverbs. If you read Proverbs, it's like, here's some words of wisdom, and here's some words of wisdom that have nothing to do with that last thing I just said. It just is kind of like thrown out there. And James is kind of the same way, except it does have the main purpose of, church, it's getting hard. This is how we need to live. So James chapter 2, in hard times, when times are tough, when can I say it? When we are not necessarily at our best, okay? This is how he tells us to live. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ, we must not show favoritism. Everyone say favoritism. favoritism. One more time. Everyone, favoritism. If you're online, I want you to type that in the chat. Favoritism. Uh, this, this favoritism word could also be partiality. Maybe if you're looking at a different version of the Bible, you might see the word partiality. Do not show partiality. And this is, this is the, the main idea that we're going to be talking about today, showing favoritism. But we gotta, before we dig into this, we've got to recognize that showing favoritism, having favorites, is a normal part of life and not necessarily an evil one, okay? Like, I guaranteed I'm going to pick barbecue over uh, Chinese food any day, okay? That's just the way it is. Uh, don't get me wrong. I like, my, I like myself some Chinese food, but at the end of the day, I'm going to choose barbecue over that. We have our favorites. There are things that we just generally are drawn to. It's kind of what makes us individuals, right? And, and, and I want to say that is okay. So, so sometimes when we are, especially when the church talks about these things, I think uh, often Sometimes due to the pastor because he preaches too much guilt, but also sometimes due to our own hearts when we receive it, we feel guilty if we feel like we have favorites. And I just got to tell you, like, God made you the way that you are for a reason, which means you like certain things over other things. You are naturally drawn to certain personalities and not other personalities, that you are going to handle certain situations in life in, in different ways because of who God made you to be, and that's okay. Where favoritism becomes an issue is when we start treating people differently because of the way that we perceive them, and it causes them harm, it causes them pain, it causes us to treat them unfairly. And that is what, that is what James is going to be talking about here. And he uses an example. Verse 2, it says, suppose a man comes to your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, someone of wealth, someone of power, someone of influence. And a poor man in filthy old clothes comes in, someone who's not taking care of themselves, someone who obviously doesn't have much money or influence, right? And then you say to them, you, you, oh, sorry, verse 3, let's say they come in and you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, well, here, here's a good seat for you. But to the poor man, you say, well, stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet. And listen to what James says. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, what happens when we judge people, when we show favoritism, so often what we do is we have to separate ourselves from them. And it's this thing that we do internally where we separate ourselves from them. We, we 
almost at a subconscious level, we start lifting off, listing off all the reasons why we are different from them, why we are not the same, why we are not their people, they are not our kind of people. And, and when we separate ourselves from them, then we are able to look down upon them. We are able to consider ourselves in a different way. We are able to judge them and in so doing so, treat them differently. But did you see what James said? James said, when we do this, have we not discriminated against yourselves? Notice how he didn't say you discriminate um, against them. He said you discriminate amongst yourself. Now, why did he say that? Well, because when we discriminate, when we judge, when we show favoritism to one against another, are we not just judging another human being that has two eyes, lungs, a heart, a head, just like you? And that the truth is that James is trying to help us see, guys, we are in this together. And that the people around us, they are us. They are us. In fact, given very different kind of, maybe a different kind of upbringing, Maybe they have been born in a different place or a different time. Things could have been completely different from where it is now. That when he says you discriminate against other people, you're actually discriminating against yourself because that's another human being. That's another human being. And when he says we do this, when we treat other people differently based on what we see, based on what we are noticing in their lives, he's, God calls us evil judges an evil judge. Now, I don't want to be known as an evil judge, okay? I don't want to be known as an evil judge. But James here is building off of some teaching that his big brother taught. James and Jesus had the same mother. Okay, obviously not the same father. Okay, but uh, James and Jesus had the same, they're half siblings, right? Which, can we talk, okay, I know I said this last week, but I'm going to say it again. Can we talk about how important that is? Okay, the fact that James himself believed that Jesus was the son of God when he spent his life growing up with them? Let me ask you something. If your siblings started saying, I'm the son of God, I am the gift of God to humanity, what would you say? He's nuts. You'd be the first one to stand up against him. But James, the brother of this guy, grew up with Jesus in the same home. He believed. That's significant. Anyways, James builds off of some teaching from Matthew. Matthew chapter through 7, 1 through 2. This is Jesus speaking. He says very clearly, do not judge or you too will be judged. This is, I mean, this is just about as clear as it gets. Do not judge or you will be judged. For the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. When we use a standard, oh, get this in your head, guys. When we use a standard of judgment against other people, God is going to use that standard against us. Tread carefully, people. Tread carefully. Because I don't know about you, but my measuring stick needs to be the universe wide, okay? I have done terrible things. I have said awful things to people. I've heard pe- I've, I am not proud of the man that I was. I'm not proud of the man I am tomorrow sometimes, okay? Like, guys, I need a large measuring stick. And Jesus is saying, listen, when we judge, God is paying attention, okay? God is paying attention. But there's a reason why, okay? There's a reason why. Because James and, of course, Jesus are building off of an understanding of God that was normal in the Jewish culture, that God is the final judge. Throughout their history, God was the judge of mankind. And the way that he would judge his people is if they followed him, he would bless them. And if they walked away from him, then he would kind of take his hand of protection off of them. Other nations would come in. They would face other kind of natural disasters and stuff. Like God would judge them. But not only that, he would set up judges who would kind of speak in his place. They would come to him, and then he would tell them what to do. They were used to this kind of relationship with God where God got to make the final call, that no one person got to make the that only God could do that. So, so when James writes these words, he's writing with this understanding that only God has the right to judge. Now, let's just talk about this on a very practical level. Let me, like, Guys, do, do any of you have the same kind of experience and, and the ability to see people for who they really are as God? Do any of us have that ability? No, you see, the truth is that you and I have a very limited experience. We really do. We have only lived in our own skin. 
We have only ever walked in our own shoes. We have only seen the few things that we have been able to see. Now, I'm, I'm 38 years old. I've been all over the world, right? I've, I've, I've spent time with the rich and the poor. I've spent time with many different cultures. I've spent time with many other peoples of faith and belief. I have friends who are missionaries. My best friend was a missionary in India for many years. I know a lot about the Indian culture, a lot about the people, just because I was consistently connected with him. Like, I would say, in general, I have a pretty decent exposure to the things of this world. But the truth is, is that I am biased towards my understanding of how things work. I am biased to my experiences, to my own worldview. And the, tr- and, and the, the truth is, is that I have not been able to see the world the way you see the world. So who am I to be able to look into your life and say, this is how you should live, right? It's, like, it's driving me nuts. As a pastor, you know how many people come to me like, oh, you'll have the answers. I'm like, oh, okay. That's why I often I tell people to go to God because, you know, he's the one that has the answers, not me. That's just my job, is to just kind of redirect, okay, to redirect. But what we need to recognize, and, and, and this is why I ask us to humbly approach the throne of grace. Because I think we can become really impressed with our own opinions. I think we can become really impressed with our own wisdom. But the truth is, when compared to the rest of the world, we are biased. So I need us to say this. Are, are, you, are you willing to confess this with me? Let's all say, I'm biased. I am biased. Okay? Say, say, I don't see everything perfectly. Let's say it. I don't see everything perfectly. Are we willing to admit this? Some of you are sitting there like, nope. I got it. You don't. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. The truth is, is that when we talk about favoritism, everyone say favoritism again. When we talk about favoritism, the truth is, is that when we understand worldviews, when we understand our ability to see things, especially when compared to God, the truth is we show favoritism to ourself. That's where we show favoritism. You and I are going to default to giving ourselves favoritism. That's just where we are. Now, life can teach us another way. Life can help us go away. But what I'm talking about are those moments of quick judgment where we just can't see it. Now, we're going to go to Romans 12, 1 through 3. And uh, this is Paul talking. Okay, now Paul says this. He says, you therefore have no excuse, you who have passed judgment on somebody else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Did you see that? When you judge other people, what you're actually doing is condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same kind of stuff. This is Paul in the midst of, of Romans 2. And as he continues, even in the next couple of chapters, his whole point here is that All of us are sinners, none of us are getting this right, and none of us are going to be able to earn the favor of God in such a way that when we stand before the ultimate judge, that we are going to be able to stand on anything we've done as being good enough. That's the point. That's what he's trying to say. And so Paul is saying here, just because that person's pet sin is not your pet sin doesn't make you any better or them any worse. He says, so when we pass judgment on other people, when we separate ourselves from them, notice a difference and say, oh, I don't like that, or oh, you shouldn't do that. What he's saying is that we are actually condemning ourselves. Listen to what he says in verse 2. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. That's really important. Now, if you don't think that God can see everything clearly, if you don't think that his way is better than any other way, this isn't going to connect with you. But for those who believe that God is the only one who can see things in truth, that is something we got to take to heart to recognize that if God's judgment is true, then that means unless I am judging according to the way that God judges, which he says not to, unless I am seeing things the way that he sees things, I am not seeing it clearly. I'm just not. I'm seeing it with a bias. I'm seeing it with a favoritism. Right? And he goes on to say, when you... <laughs> A mere human, right? When, and, and you know Paul is talking about himself here too. When we, as mere humans, pass judgment on others and yet do the same thing, or, or even the way that it's written in the Greek, the same kind of things, do you think we'll escape? Right? Do you think when we stand before God, if we're like, yeah, but God, I wasn't as bad as that person, or I didn't do that, 
Have you ever noticed when you compare yourselves to others, you're either really winning well or really losing really poorly? You know God wants, he just wants us to stop that in general. Humility is not looking down on others. I mean, sorry, pride is not just looking down on others. Pride is also when we give ourselves a hard time for not being as good as other people. Humility is just knowing who we are and being okay with it. That's humility, right? And he's saying, <laughs> just because, just because you, your sin is different from others, you think you're going to escape? And then verse, verse 11, listen to this, says, for God does not show favoritism. For God does not show favoritism. Now that word that Paul used, that James used, is this word proso, I practiced this a hundred times last night and I still didn't get it, prosopolepsia. Prosopolepsia, and what it means is the fault of one who called, who, when called on to give judgment, has respect of the outer circumstances of man and not their intrinsic, intrinsic merits. Okay, that this, this idea of favoritism, this idea of partiality, is when we look upon people and we judge them based on the outward person, the outward circumstance, while ignoring their inherent, their intrinsic their intrinsic merits. Now, in this world, it's a common idea that all human life is sacred, that just because a person is a person, they need to be respected. It's an important part of our law, of the laws of our country, that just because they're a person, they deserve respect and they should be taken care of. That's a normal part of this. But guys, I want to take that up a notch. When we see other people, okay, whenever we encounter someone and we may not like the way they look. We might not like the way that they're behaving. If we find ourselves being in that place of separating ourselves from them and, and considering ourselves any different them th than them. Guys, when we do that, what we are doing is we are basing it on the outward person and forgetting the inward individual who is and has been created in the image of God. Okay, the, when we talk about the intrinsic merits of, the, of someone... Every person that you can't stand, God made them. And they carry with them a spiritual DNA of the God that you believe in. And so when we judge other people, we are not despising the individual. We actually find that we are despising the God who created them. And that's how God takes it. That's what God sees, right? And so when I talk about judging the outward man, this is the kind of thing. This is like, this is at the center of this uh, of this problem in humanity is uh, things like discrimination and racism. That we, that we view people based on the way they look. That when we see someone that looks different from us, we make assumptions based on our past experiences and the things that we understand about the people who look like them. That's racism. And the unfortunate part is that so often we don't think about the many good things that that person that is different from us, all the things, we often think about the negative side of things and that we just have this natural tendency and it's kind of a, a fear response, it's kind of a self-protection response and there's been a lot of research on that, I'm telling you, I wanted to go so in, guys, how about this, you guys all got an extra hour, right, because daylight's, can we just use that right now, is that cool? What we do is we look at people and we view them differently based on our own past experiences with people who look the same, okay? That's what we do. So racism is at the heart of this, but also anything like the way someone dresses or the way they do their hair. Like, I'm serious, you will see someone who has a similar hairstyle to someone that you know and your brain triggers and starts making assumptions about that person, not because of who they are, but because of the people that you have connected with in the past that looks like them, okay? And things like piercings and... and Tattoos and stuff will, you know, it'll connect you to other things that you already, that you have already, con that you've already experienced and things that you think and, and beliefs. I'm telling you, my grandpa, my grandpa was like 100% against tattoos. And I, you know, I was like, why? Right? And we talked about it. He's like, well, no, actually, he and I didn't talk much. It was more my mom. She said, don't show your grandpa you got a tattoo. Right? I'm like, why? He's like, well, because he'll say that the Old Testament's going on, you know, in the Old Testament. I'm like, but mom, that's the Old Testament. We're under a new covenant now. Like, that's, that's not the same. And he's like, well, it's actually, it's because in his generation it was connected to, you know, dangerous people, gangs, and that kind of stuff. That's what it was. Right? 
So the fact is, is that my grandpa, who's the best person in the world, <laughs> couldn't stand my tattoos, okay? It's because of his past experience, right? Uh, how about, you know, let's go, how about this? How about the way people act in the moment? The way that we people, the way that we see people behave, right? When we see someone getting upset in line at the grocery store, what do we, what do we start to assume about them? right? We see someone smoking on the street, okay? We, we get cut off by that person in traffic. The way that they act, we, ju- we make assumptions about them. Guys, this happens to us at the grocery, like, I know I just talked about the grocery store, but listen, I'll be going, like, walking down the aisle, right? And there are two people with grocery carts that drive me insane, okay? It is either the person that speed walks everywhere, around me. I'm like, do you, like, what is going on in your life that you got to move that fast, right? Drives me nuts, right? Because, and they always kind of, they, they always, it's, it's, I'm really, they always have great posture, which bugs me because I have terrible posture. They always have great posture and they always look really healthy or whatever. And I'm just like, Nyeh. but then at the opposite end is the person that walks down the middle of the aisle And I'm standing behind him like, I could probably go all the way around. I just need the, the ketchup over there, right? And it's like, they've looked at their third bottle of mustard, and I just, need the, I just need the ketchup, right? See, but the thing is, while I'm standing there, it's that is the most natural thing that I start making assumptions based on other people that I know who kind of behave like this, right? But the truth is, is when I do that, I forget the intrinsic value of who God created them to be, and I, and I base my understanding of, a, of a the person and the way that I treat them, right, the way that I treat them. So when I hear Miss Fast Lady, who's walking really fast behind me, I kind of, I become the slow one in the middle just to like, <laughs> you can't get around me now. I'm just kidding. I don't do that. I don't do that. I might do that if you're driving, okay? I'll, I'll be able to admit. If you're an insane driver, if you're being just crazy out there, I will get in front of you and drive slow just because just I know it's going to make your blood boil. But see, here's the, okay, okay, are we clear? <laughs> okay, listen, I'm not saying this is good. <laughs> you, uh, is, am I being clear? What I'm saying is, is I struggle with this stuff, okay? <laughs> in fact, I, I wrote this sermon three weeks ago, and I'm telling you, the spirit has been hitting Man, he just keeps pinging my heart. Jeff, you're doing it again. Dude, you're doing it again. Right? Let's, let's get back. Okay, how about the way that we judge parents based on their children's behavior? We see the way the kid is acting, and we make assumptions. How about the kind of job that someone has? You know, just we, we, we attach their value we attach what we think we know about them based on the kind of job they have, the way that they've climbed up the ladder. And we assume certain things about them. And then on the other side, we assume things different about those who haven't. Can I just tell you, some of the best people I've ever met in my life, some of the wisest people I've ever met, they're doing the day jobs. And they're the ones getting up in the middle of the night to stock shelves for you. Right? And you know, so often they've just found peace. Well, how about this? The kind of house someone has, the state of their lawn some of y'all, I know, I know there are people in this room right now who just cannot stand their neighbor right now. Why did he just pick his weeds? Right? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. But we got to, I'm trying to make a case for the fact that when we do this, do you know what God sees in our hearts? What God sees in our hearts is contempt for grace. For the believer who has accepted the grace and, and the glory of Jesus Christ into their life is someone who has said, I'm not good enough. I need a Savior. That's why I need this Jesus who died on the cross for me, because I'm never going to be enough, right? But when we receive that grace for ourselves, but do not show it to the people around us, in Romans 2, 4 through 6, it says that we show contempt for the riches of his kindness, when we continue to show favoritism and make these snap judgments, we are not showing contempt for the individual. We are showing contempt to him because he is up in heaven going, to, dude, haven't I given you so much? 
Haven't I paid for so much so that you can be free of the guilt of your past, so that you can live with yourself, that you're not perfect, you don't get everything right, but that I love you and it doesn't matter and I want to be with you. I want to have a relationship with you. I have given you so much. Why can we not see everyone as someone that God wants to give this love to? Because that's what this, is, what this is all about. The reason he does not want us to judge is so that we can be vessels of grace. Listen to Titus, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Okay, now, now Titus, when, when this was written, it was talking about who? The grace of God has appeared. Who is this grace? It's the Christ. This is Jesus The grace of God appeared in the form of a man who came and died on the cross for our sins. Grace has now appeared, and it offers salvation to all people. But Jesus didn't stay, did he? He died, he resurrected, and then he ascended to heaven. And then he gave us, he gave us the job of being ambassadors of his grace. Meaning, we then receive the grace of God for our forgiveness of sins. We become vessels of the grace and the goodness that he has given us so that we can give it to other people, so that other people can see that the grace of God is around them, that God wants you, his church, to be vessels of grace to the world. Do you know what's really tough about this, though? Go read it. There's a book called Unchristian. And I, want, I know it's like, my pastor told me to read a book called Unchristian. Yes, go read it, because it's a book based on a study that was done for people outside the church. Okay, people outside the church, what do you see when you look inside the church? And you know what the number one thing is? We're talking like 90% of the people outside of the church. When they see us, do you know what they see? They see a group of judgmental people. Judgment, that's what they see. There are people walking around right now carrying the scars of words that, or, or, or expressions or the way someone was treated based on their sin, not based on the intrinsic value of who they are. That someone out there has an aunt that has condemned them for a certain lifestyle, and that person is not interested in Jesus because of a judgmental Christian that forgot the intrinsic value of that individual and base their judgment on outward circumstances, outward sin, outward behavior, forgetting the grace that they had received. Church, we are being called to a higher standard, to not act like the rest of the world. The rest of the world that, that just, hey, everyone gets to make their choice, and everyone gets to judge for themselves what's right and what's wrong, and hey, you know, we, let's, we are called to something different, to trusting a standard that was set by God Knowing we're never going to make it, receiving grace, and then giving that out to everyone. That's what we've been called to do. Listen to 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18. It says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Everyone say freedom. freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. See, we have inside of us this natural brokenness to separate ourselves from other people, to look down on other people or to look up. Again, the looking up and comparing yourself in a bad way, not good for you, man. I want you to be free of that, okay? That is, that is not the life that God has called you to. He's called you to live a life of freedom. And what we need to do, guys, if you could take anything from today, anything from today and take it, what, you, what we need to do is tomorrow morning we need to wake up and spend time with Jesus looking at his, contemplating the Lord's glory. Now, when we contemplate the Lord's glory, we then go live our lives around a world that is broken, filled with people who are going to disappoint us, filled with people who are going to hurt us, filled with people who are going to purposefully try to tear you down. And when those moments come, we will remember the glory of our Lord that sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. And instead of responding like the rest of the world, we respond in grace. We respond in freedom. Guys, this is what God wants for you, okay? This is what, you know what? When you judge other people, those chains are yours. That you are, how many of you are like, I love judging people because it's just, yeah, I am my best person when I'm judging other people. No, we know we're, ter- we're terrible when we do that, right? 
Like we are not at our best. And, and sometimes it feels good. But do you know why it feels good to judge other people? Because finally, we're allowing ourselves to get our minds off of how terrible we are. And we get to feel better about ourselves because we are seeing bad in other people. That's why we feel better. Because we're so caught up in our own mistakes. So, called up, so caught up in our own uh, brokenness that it's nice to be distracted by someone else's brokenness. But in that moment, that's not good. It's not, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel great. It beca- in fact, we have seen people who just constantly judge. What do we see them become? Embittered. We, we, or maybe you've become that person. You just become embittered because all you can do is see the bad and see the bad and see the ugly. See, and, and guys, God wants to call you away from that into a place of freedom. He wants you to first be free from your sin, that the sin that you have committed, the terrible things that you have done, the terrible things that I have said to the people I love the most, guys, Jesus is saying, listen, uh, yeah, I don't want you to do that, but tell you what, I'm going to forget that. Okay, I'm going to forget that you ever did that. Put your trust in me and let's walk together so that we can live a little bit different. Okay? That's the deal that he offers us, right? As we put our faith in him and follow him, he is allowing us to get past the ugliness inside of us. He's allowing us to forgive ourselves. And when we forgive ourselves, then we walk into a world that needs forgiveness. And then when we see that ugly, nasty behavior We see that person that's different from us. We are now living from a new spirit. Because where the spirit of the Lord inside of you is, there is freedom. Freedom from your own sin. And then freedom from looking down on others. Freedom from that ugly side of yourself. Freedom. Say it again with me. Freedom. Freedom. Put it in the chat. If you're watching us online, put that in the chat. James says it too. James 2, 12 through 13. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful, but mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That means mercy wins. Okay? Unfortunately, when we judge other people, we get a feeling like we've won. We feel like we've won something. But all we've won is this dumb little battle inside of our heads that we know eventually we're just going to lose again. But when we have mercy, there's freedom. Okay? Very two different days in my life. Both of them at High V. Okay? Go to High V. And I get stuck behind her. Not just once. Not just twice. But three times. Grandma Jean, I called her in my head. It seemed like we were shopping for the same stuff. After the third time, I almost offered, tell you what, I'll just get double of everything I'm getting. I'll meet you at the counter, okay? We'll just do that. And I left the, I mean, I left Hy-Vee steaming, frustrated at Grandma Jean. Okay, because I was stuck in some stuff. I was in pain, and I wasn't seeing clearly. I go back to High V, and in my mind, I met her husband, <laughs> Grandpa John. We'll call him Grandpa John. But you know, that day, that day, I had started right. I'd started remembering about the goodness of God. I was listening to worship music on the way. Worship music is so good at reminding us of this stuff, guys. Listen to worship music. And I got to High V and I remembered Grandma Jean. And I got behind Grandpa John. And I thought, what a treasure this man is. Probably, you know, like, I don't know his story. But the years of wisdom that are probably behind those eyes, the things he's probably, I mean, just because of his age, the things that he has been through, World War II, the depression, the things I could learn from him, right? And I just started looking at not the problem that I was annoyed with, but the person, the person he was. Do you see the difference? And that through the Spirit of God, you and I have the potential to receive that gift 
every day and then to give it every day. Okay? Grandma Jean probably looked a little bit afraid of me. She was probably a little bit afraid of me. Big guy with a big beard. Next, she sees me a third time and I'm like, oh, you know? She's probably like, what did I do? This man's going to hurt me. Poor Grandma Jean. If, you, if I ever see her again, I just I need to apologize. Okay? You see, the way that I treated her is different because of the way that I was viewing God. Do you see that? The way that I was treating her differently was because of the way that I was seeing God in the moment. And you and I are offered that gift. So, so here's what we need to do. We're going to sing a song here soon. Or are we not? Jake, we doing this? Yeah, we're doing this. Come on. Yeah. I told you guys I was going to use up your whole extra hour. I'm sorry. I, that was a joke. I didn't mean to make it true. Man, I still have so many other scriptures. Here's what we need to do. I want you to right now think of the person that you tend to judge consistently. Think about that person. And if you're sitting back going like, well, that's nobody. And it's like, well, okay, well, uh, maybe that's a different sermon that we need to talk about. But I want you to think of the person that you've judged recently. Or maybe, again, maybe you're like me. You get on the road and you become a different person. But seriously, guys, I get the Holy Spirit, man. I need him in that driver's, in that uh, passenger seat with me. Um, anyway, so I want you to think about the person that you judge the most. And I want you to remember that mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy wins. And I want you to think about how you can show that person mercy instead of the judgment they normally receive from you. How can you show them mercy? And when I say show them mercy, I'm not saying, well, I'll make a decision in my head to not think badly about them. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you actively pursue living differently around them. That you start seeing them as a, as a, as a create. God made them the same way that he made you. His image is in that. Do you see? Right now, put that person in your head. Do you see his image in them? Do you see his image? Do you see the fact that God spent time putting that person together in their mother's womb? That this is a real person who has faced real pain. This is a real person who has real hopes, real desires, real dreams. Do you see that person the way that God fully sees them? Because that's what I want you to attempt to do. To stop seeing the problem. To stop seeing the outer person. Stop seeing how they dress. Stop seeing the way they take care of their lawn. Stop seeing the way that they drive. Stop seeing all this stuff and just ask yourself, do I see that God made this person on purpose? And that God wants to bring this person home to the same heaven you want to go to, God wants to bring that child home. Embrace that person with that kind of understanding and love, and mercy will be so much easier. And may we, and may we use this person as like this declaration, like, no, I'm going to live different, man. I'm going to live different. I got to live different. My heart is so hurting because I'm constantly looking down on people. I'm constantly going like, you know, you know, you know this expression? That's what I'm talking about. When you go, you shouldn't do that. I don't like the way they did that. Can you believe that? If you catch yourself doing that, that's the moment you need to stop and pray for forgiveness. And then say, okay, that person, okay. Remember what Pastor Jeff said. Okay, I need to see that person like a child of God. I need to see that person as created by God. I wonder what their life has been like. I wonder what difficulties they've faced. I wonder what kind of dreams they have for their lives. You stop and think. Pray. Remember the grace that you want from God when you stand before the only judge. Remember that grace and then hand it over. And you know what you're going to find when you do it? Freedom. Freedom. So, we're going to stand. We're going to sing a song. Let's pray. And I really, and during this song, 
I want you to picture this person while you even sing this song. I want you to picture this person as, as you imagine what their life is like. I want you to picture this person as we sing these words, and, and I want you to ask the question, like, man, what does God see when he sees them? What, how does this have to relate to them, right? And then maybe pray for them. Right? Maybe ask God for forgiveness and say, God, I'm sorry. I've shown contempt for your grace as I've judged this person. So let's sing this song. Oh, you know, I'm not going to pray. We're just going to play. We're just going to go. Church, just sing this out.
when I don't see it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. song is really important is because, uh, again, it's we're, we're trying to get God into uh, our understanding of that individual, right? And so often when we see people, uh, we forget that God is with them as much as he's with us, right? And he wants to be with them just as much as us. So if ever you are discouraged by someone, you're like, Jeff, listen, I know I judge them, but like, you don't know what it's like to be around them. Right, you would judge them too, and you're probably right. I would. I, I I hope it's been clear that I am not. I don't have this figured out. Okay, I struggle with this just like anyone else. But what can help us is recognizing that God is there. He is with them, and believing that God wants to save them and wants to see them happy and peaceful and joyous and not difficult. And you know, He wants to see them more than you ever could, and that you have no idea. You have no idea what he has already been doing in their life. Can you believe that? Can you trust that? Again, it'll help you from judging. Okay, guys, thank you for your patience, especially if you're new. I, I was clear this isn't how it normally goes, right? Woo, don't look at that clock. Let's just go. Guys, thank you for being here. We have uh, baskets you can give to uh, if you want to continue to be a part of what we're doing here at Hope Summit. Oh, but I will say, I'm sorry. You see these boxes right here? I'm going to show this to you. These are our one-for-one -one boxes. You see how there's like pocket change in here? We ask you guys to give a dollar every week because every dollar you guys give is going to be used to be a blessing in someone in the community. Right now, there's a young man who has a very rare bone cancer. Uh, sorry, has a very rare cancer, and he just had a... Uh, a bone marrow transplant. He's living with his mother who's a single mom to other kids. She's got a lot of irons in the fire and now she's having to take care of him. Every dollar you guys give for the next few weeks is going to be added up into a check. To a, It's typically around five to seven hundred dollars and that is going to be given to them. So put your pocket change in here and it's going to be used as a blessing. All right. Thank you for being here. Would love to have you back next week.